Allow me to introduce you to the brand new federal riding of Edmonton Griesbach. We'll start down here on the banks of the North Saskatchewan River up to the Yellowhead Trail, work our way up to the north, then we start turning west, comes along here. For some reason it drops back to the south, then it carries on west, and then goes back over here, and then comes back over this way, again for no apparent reason, drops back down, comes back to the river, and when you finished, what you've got is something that looks like the state of Texas, which I'm told is just a coincidence. This man, Dr. Brian Gold, was part of the committee that recommended the new riding boundaries. What was the uh, the reason for the redraw in the first place, Brian? What oh, because was, Alberta, was necessary? because Alberta has added uh, because they've added several new because of population growth, they had to have new seats overall. So there's been new ones um, in rural uh, Calgary, especially Calgary and Edmonton. Which means there is no incumbent seeking re-election here. One of these four people, Dr. Brian Gold, Liberal, Heather Workman, Green Party, Carrie Diot, Conservative, or Janice Irwin of the NDP, will be the first member of Parliament for the riding of Edmonton Griesbach. A diverse neighborhood of just over 100,000 people from a wide range of ethnic and economic backgrounds. Little Italy is found here, as is Edmonton's Chinatown. It contains neatly capped homes on the banks of the North Saskatchewan River and a broad cross-section of businesses. Historically, this area of the Wild Rose province has been conservative with a capital C. Alberta has consistently, uh, for several elections now, voted majority conservative by far. We have one uh, non-conservative MP in the province right now. Uh, but I think there's a lot of people expecting that to change and shift a little bit this time. Uh, at the very least, it's going to be a lot more competitive this time. Uh, every riding that we're looking at has strong opposition candidates, which wasn't the case last time. We saw a lot of uh, write-in candidates from some of the opposition parties last time. Um, and the two major cities, I think, are going to be much more competitive than they've, than they've ever been previously. It's an understandable point of view given the results of the spring's provincial election. Obviously, in the spring, it showed that they can vote for someone other than the Conservatives electing the NDP uh, provincially. Uh, in the cities, all of the ridings have shifted in a way that uh, probably favors opposition parties. Those trends are music to the ears of this woman, Janice Irwin, a resident of the riding, a teacher, and the candidate for the NDP. Hi, Janice. Hi. David Kincaid from CPAC. Nice to meet you, David. Thanks so much for oh, your time. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. What an impressive operation. You know, we've uh, we've been at it a while, so it's uh, pretty exciting. You're not a startup, then. You've been doing this for some time? That's right, yeah. No, I've been our candidate for over a year. I've been, uh, I've been seeking the nomination for nearly two years, and uh, we've had the office since uh, May. So. Tell me, for those who don't know, who is Janice Irwin? Uh, well, I am our NDP candidate here in our new riding of Edmonton Griesbaugh, and uh, prior to that I was a teacher for a number of years and an administrator in rural Alberta, and uh, for the past few years I worked for the provincial government uh, with working with the social studies curriculum for Alberta education. And is, is the NDP always been aligned with your principles and values, or is this something that you've adopted more recently? No, you know, I've been a New Democrat supporter for, for a number of years, and uh, I think that's what makes it easy as a candidate, because the, the NDP's values are my values, so uh, it's easy to talk about your values when they align with the party so well. Well, well expand on that a little bit if you can. What are, what are the things that you would like people to know uh, about you as, a, as an individual? Sure, well, and maybe I can talk a little bit about why I decided to run. You know, I live here in our riding of Edmonton Griesbaugh, and uh, I started to see, as I, as I moved into our community a few years ago, I started to see some of some issues, some social issues, and recognized that, you know, nearly two decades of conservative representation really hadn't served our community. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time in Boyle Street, Macaulay, neighborhoods where we have, um, you know, high levels of homelessness. We have a number of social issues that certainly just haven't been addressed. So, like I said, I thought, you know what, it's, it's time that we, you know, we do something different federally here. And, uh, and it's been exciting because we've got a lot of support. People are energized by the fact that we can elect a new Democrat member of Parliament here. Which is undoubtedly wise because the experts will tell you the provincial election last spring and the federal election this fall are two very different contests. I think there's, there's some factor there, but you don't want to overstate it because the thing that is really distinctly different um, uh, in this election as compared to the provincial one is that uh, the conservative vote isn't split. In the provincial election, you had the conservatives, uh, the progressive conservatives, and the Wild Rose splitting the conservative vote, which helped uh, the NDP in a lot of ridings. 
uh, that effect was more pronounced in Calgary, but it was here in Edmonton as well. And so uh, I think it, the provincial election certainly has an impact here, uh, but it's not enough to say that the NDP won uh, provincially so they'll win federally. It just won't translate that way. In other words, this riding is up for grabs. Kerry Diot is the Conservative Party standard bearer for Edmonton Griesbaugh. As a former city councillor and mayoralty candidate, Diot has the most name recognition of the four candidates, but he is a long way from taking this race lightly. Are you approaching this more as a marathon than a sprint? Well, I think, it, yeah, it is definitely a marathon. I mean, I've been at this for the better part of a year and a half uh, through the nomination, did a lot of door knocking there. And uh, the great thing about it now, of course, is when I go to the doors, people go, hey, weren't you just here last year? Yes, I was. And uh, I was asking you to buy a membership and so forth. So uh, it's nice to uh, go to the doors and, and be recognized. And also I was at the doors when I, when I campaigned to be mayor of Edmonton, so they remember me from that. So I think the recognition is quite good. And, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, it's a, it's a lot of uh, a lot of work on the ground, and that's what that's what you've got to do with the campaign, right? I mean, when I was a when I was a journalist uh, investigating the first time running as a as a uh, civic politician, I, I talked to everybody I could and said, "How do you win? How do you how do you get elected?" Because I've covered it, but um, what, what what is the key? And they say they all said, "Door knock, door knock, door knock," and that's that's what I'm concentrating on. That's a very tried and true, some might say old-fashioned approach in a day of Twitter and Facebook and what have you, but it's still effective. It is, and, and in some ways, actually, we've gone back to that face-to-face -face contact because, as you know, how many emails do you get? How many times, you know, have, you know you've been on Twitter and you're besieged with messages or Facebook or... Um, so we've gotten back, I think, to a, a, a place where people want that face-to-face, -face, and they love it. They love it at the doors. It's it's almost uh, it's it's a guaranteed vote if, if somebody is somewhat like-minded, and uh, and you get to the door and you've made the effort, and, and I think that's really important. So it, it's it's that one-to-one -one connection. Yes. Man, that's a that's a big mountain to climb, then, isn't it, to get that many one-to-ones to constitute an election? That's right. Yeah, it is. It's a lot of work. What's the motivation? Uh, my motivation or their motivation? Your motivation. Why would you change careers at this stage and decide that you're going to try to become a member of Parliament? Well, it's a natural progression. I mean, I was a journalist for many years doing similar things to what you're doing. I was an opinion columnist. What I really got a charge out of it was the fact that I could help people. That's, that's the basis of it. And, you know, I do columns, and the, the, the columns that are most rewarding are when something would change, where somebody's been hard done by perhaps, or overlooked, or uh, mired in red tape somewhere, and as a columnist I could solve that problem. Same thing, when I was a city councillor, I, I loved the problem solving. Somebody would come to me, I, I prided myself on being a good constituency person, and that's what gives me the charge, because it's all, it's, it really, it's, without being trite, it really is about public service, and I think that <clears throat> a lot of people forget that, because my number one job as a member of parliament is to serve my constituents and help them when they have problems. I think that's the exciting part and that's why our campaign has been going so well is we've our team's been at this a long time and uh, we've been able to really grow in the community and uh, really make a connection with with people all over. I gotta draw one sure. thing to your attention if I can. Um, this looks like a leftover from Oh, yeah. The provincial <laughs> campaign. Mr. Mason, who's been an incredible supporter of ours. In fact, so what happened is this office here was his provincial campaign office. Yeah. And so uh, we were able to smoothly, after, after the election in May, take the office over. And, uh, and it's been great because, I mean, so many, uh, you, as you know, our provincial and federal parties work so closely together. And uh, so many of his volunteers are our volunteers and vice versa. So it's, it's been a really smooth transition and we're able to work together and that's... And when the provincial election went the way it did, with such a resounding win for the NDP, that has to be a, an enormous uh, uplifting sensation for you. It really has, and it's neat, though. Um, honestly, I can say this. Our riding here of Edmonton Griesbaugh was winnable for us prior to the provincial election. As I said, I mean, I was nominated in June of 2014 as our candidate. We had 300 people out at the Alberta Avenue Hall, just north of here, 
prior to any of the provincial success. So we had that, that ground game going. We had that momentum going months ahead of the provincial election. And uh, we were just able to, to build on that. And it was neat because we had three NDP MLAs within our federal riding prior to the provincial election. Now we've got five. So you're not taking... You, you like the way the, the provincial election went, that's but right. that's you're not hanging your hat on no, that. No, not at all, and that's why I mean, like I said, our team's been been laying the groundwork far before that, and uh, and knowing that it was just it, it was certainly a positive development. It's great to have uh, Rachel Notley as our premier. Great to have leaders like Brian Mason as cabinet ministers. Um, but like you said, we're just continuing the work that we've already been doing. And and given the the experience you had, uh, I dare say. It doesn't surprise you the amount of work, but I'm looking at this. That's right. That's daunting. It, it is. It's. It's a. What is it? So the, these are our poll boards, and basically what it, it shows is the neighborhoods that we've been in in Edmonton Greasebaugh, and uh, we, it, as you've seen, I mean Edmonton Greasebaugh is a huge riding. It's very diverse, east to west. It it it, it uh, covers it covers a huge area here in Edmonton. Um, so it is. I mean, I've been knocking on doors for nearly two years, and they've yet to cover the entire riding. Wow. So that says something. Um, we're almost there, and, and as I said to you, uh, provincially, during the provincial election, so essentially from about uh, January to May, I was knocking on doors with our provincial candidates and really building, building, the, you know, building that momentum at the provincial level, knowing, hoping that that support would translate federally. The Liberals, with Dr. Brian Gold, are also in it to win it. I'm Brian Gold, Hi. sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm the, uh, stunned by the cuteness of your child. Uh, I, I'm the Liberal candidate, federal li Liberal candidate for Edmonton Greaseball, which is the riding that you're in. At the end of the day, we need to vote for the best candidates for the area and just hope that they represent well. Gold, an academic, teaches at the University of Alberta. This is his first attempt at political office. What makes you a qualified candidate to represent uh, the people of Edmonton Griesbach for the Liberal Party? In terms of my academic uh, side and being a teacher, you know, it's funny. You think of teachers as, you know, lecturing and, <laughs> and, and berating. Actually, it's, it's amazing as a teacher what you learn from your students, and you have to listen. You know, so I, I think politicians, I think it's a good thing I'm, this is the first time I'm running for office. I'm not a professional politician. Um, I think politicians talk too much. They should listen more. And, and so that's sort, of, that's sort of gained from my teaching experience, and I thought that's something I bring as MP. He has been on the hustings since the day he won the Liberal nomination, knocking on doors and listening. They're saying they want a, a government that actually listens to them, uh, a government that... Um, that they can, that they feel a part of. They feel like there's something, the Canada isn't living up to its potential, basically. And and they want a government that will bring us to that. And how do you address that issue when you when you're standing on the doorstep? What what are you offering? Well, I, the recently, I mean, when you're going to, you know, it's it, the answer has been different over the months. Uh, you know, door knocking uh, issues that are coming up right now, especially for uh, Edmonton Greasebaugh. The biggest, uh, one of the biggest issues is the infrastructure. It's an older, a lot of it, it it's a varied area, but a lot of it uh, borders on the traditional, on downtown. It's an older area, uh, sort of in infrastructure. So uh, Mr. Trudeau's um, infrastructure plan is, is incredibly resonant, uh, incredibly attractive to people. And, and uh, when, if I introduce that, or a lot of people bring it up to me, they want to ask about it. Um, that's, that's sort of the change, that the concrete change. $125 billion over the next 10 years, doubling infrastructure spending, is the, um, the kind of thing that they're interested to hear about or talk about. And do you think that that kind of an election promise is contingent on electing Brian Gold in the riding to get that money delivered? Is the money going to go to where there are liberal representatives? No, uh, it, it's not. We're not going to do that type of politics. Uh, we we are the party of national unity that thinks nationally. Uh, we'll leave the critics uh, to uh, try to carve up, let's say, their part of Canada and represent that. We have always been the party of that thinks of Canada as a whole and the party of national unity. 
And then there is the Green Party's Heather Workman. I'm Heather Workman. I'm running for the Green Party of Canada in your riding. What Workman lacks in the way of a big political machine backing her, she makes up for with sheer enthusiasm. Who is Heather Workman for those people that don't know you? Um, for those that don't know me, I think I'm just your ordinary neighbor that would live down your street, give you a hand, help you out um, if you needed help with things in your garden or... Um, and does that qualify to make you an MP? For sure, because I'll take it even a step further because there's also a lot of people that are having difficulty um, moving through government services and programs and it is not unheard of for me to get on the horn and try to speak on their behalf or advocate for them and I've been doing this for years anyways. So even though you haven't held elected office That's before, right. you've been an advocate? Absolutely. Give me an example. Um, well, there's a, a friend of mine who had issues with arthritis and needed to have surgery done uh, and had a lot of difficulty getting the proper services for that. Yeah. I made a few phone calls for them and within 45 minutes they received a phone call and uh, they had an appointment set up so that they can get all the services that they needed. Okay, so you've got the knack of getting things done. Yes. Why would you represent the Green Party? Because everybody I talk to says the Green Party has no chance. <laughs> Well, I, I believe, and this is just me, I've taken a look at all of uh, the federal parties and what they can offer to people, and I read their policies, and when I read the Green Party uh, vision green, that stood out for me, and that's something that I felt like my values, they match quite well. So the Green Party is more than just a one-issue party, they actually have solutions for a lot of the issues that Canadians are facing these days, and that's what makes the Green Party so attractive, because they have the answers to the problems. Now, if you, if we were having this conversation in the southern Gulf Islands of British Columbia, okay. I might say, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but in northern Alberta, it seems like you've <laughs> picked a particularly steep mountain to climb. I would say so, but I'm a long-term Albertan. I've lived here for more than 40-some-odd uh, years, 43 years, and this is my home. And you might find that there's a lot, of more, lot more people that are very open to innovative uh, ideas. For example, we have a lot of oil and gas workers that are out of work right now. My firm belief is that the powers that be, meaning government or any of the parties, knew that we were going to have issues with the oil and gas industry here in Alberta. We should have prepared for it. Green economy is one of those things that is... Um, Got, it's got a long-term vision, it is more sustainable than what we have right now, and there's a lot of people that are out of work that would not be out of work were we prepared. And I think that there's a lot of smart people that live right here in Edmonton, right here in Alberta, matter of fact, there's a lot of very smart people. We could have staved off this issue of unemployment. Even though there are four official candidates in this race, Diot believes his main rival is Janice Irwin of the NDP. You don't have to be a you know, political science to know that it's going to be a runoff between myself and, and the NDP here. So that's, uh, uh, you can see it from the law and science. There's no doubt that it, it will be a competitive race here, absolutely no doubt. But it comes down to hard work and uh, we will definitely, and, and good policy, and we will definitely uh, outwork the competition. And this is perhaps one of the few areas of this campaign that you'll get Carrie Diot and Janice Irwin to agree on. Is it a four-way race? Uh, no, it's, it's definitely not. I mean, you know, like I said, the neat thing is that we've our team has been at this a long time. We've certainly put in a lot of work, and uh, people see that the NDP is is a front runner here, and uh, and you know, people are excited about that. I would say the Conservatives uh, have been running a bit of a campaign as well, and 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 that's fine. But we're so focused on us, we're not we're not concerned about the competition. But what are those problems facing the citizens of Edmonton Griesbach? Well, it depends on who you ask. We drop by the local coffee shop to hear what the voters have to say about this election and the issues that matter to them. Thinking of the elderly, okay, so it always seems to be an issue. Um, well, of course, job situation, you know, with uh, oil and the fluctuation in the, the oil industry there, you know, it's just hard times for everybody, I guess, all around, depending on your job. For myself, I'm a senior, he's a senior, so uh, having a livable wage. <laughs> That's important to everyone. It, well, it is, you know, having, having a, enough so that you can live 
I don't want to have steak every day, but, you know, just to be able to live comfortably. Yeah, I think if they would boost the seniors' allowance better instead of that minimum 525, I think that's what it is, it would be a lot better for the, for the seniors in the country. And as far as the political party is concerned, I have no preferences right yet. I'm still making up my mind who to vote for. You will certainly hear about the specific issues concerning individuals, but you'll also find a lot of this. What about the federal election? Are you engaged? Are you are you interested? Not at all. How come? I am actually not following the, the election. Why trust any of them? You, you lose faith over the years because everybody who... You vote in, makes the mistakes, and it affects everybody. And we've got three dummies trying to run the country. And you don't like any of them? No. One's as one just dumb as the other. And while those strongly held and strongly stated opinions are important, there is one overarching issue facing Edmonton Griesbach. It's the economy. Is that a fair statement? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That was just like last night. That's what I was... Uh, whether the peop Whether people were... Whatever way they were leaning or... Mostly it was a lot of, um, well, not, not for the status quo, let's put it that way. Uh, the, re the recession and the economy was number one on everybody's mind. I've never seen an election where citizens are as aware of what's going on, of, of the issues uh, and concerned, and it's really very impressive. It's really impressive. Impressive or worrying? Because if that issue is so top of mind, it, it may be because they're worried about losing their jobs and they're frightened. Yeah, but it's a, I mean, I'll say impressive because it's good for people to have a political awareness. Absolutely. And, <laughs> you know, so that's the way I'm meaning it. Uh, the, the underlying situation that's driving that uh, awareness, perhaps, as you say, might be, uh, it, is a, it is a scary thing. We're the only country in the G7 that's, uh, having a recession. Why is that? Well, well yeah. isn't the answer because certainly in this part of the world, the, 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 uh, the success of the province and, the, and, this, mm -hmm. um, and this city is tied very tightly to the price of oil? Uh, it is, but, you know, who made the policy where we're putting everything into oil? Um, even in this province, we have a burgeoning... It, it, even Alberta is not about just oil. There is uh, world-class capabilities in construction, um, in engineering, in, in higher education that are actually without the support of anybody in particular in terms of our governments that we've had here, nationally or locally, uh, have been thriving as export industries with nobody, you know, with, and without much help. I mean, we've had... Invisibly. The, invisibly, you know, and this is a travesty. There's, the, there's more to Alberta than just oil. Carrie Diot disagrees, suggesting oil extraction and transportation are the keys to Edmonton and Alberta's collective future. And it's very clear that this uh, conservative federal government is very much in favor of promoting that and, and because it means jobs for families, it means, you know, it means wealth for not just Edmonton and Alberta, but the entire country. And the, the NDP are not, they're not big backers of the oil sands. They call it, you know, der derisively the tar sands. They don't, they're not fans of pipelines. They, they don't want to get our product to market. I think that's, uh, and that resonates with people because a lot of jobs are at stake and a lot of, a lot of families depend on the oil industry. Everybody would like to have a more diverse economy, uh, and, uh, but we are still, uh, the oil industry is still the number one industry here. Uh, and we've got to, we've got to you know, get our, our oil to market. And we've got to continue to, to develop it in a sustainable, you know, in a sustainable way. When they look at the three leaders, truly, and um, it comes up and uh, they talk about the prime minister or they talk about the other two, um, they're, you know, they're, they're really thinking hard, thinking, well, who is best to represent this country right now in our, in our situation? And, and they're, they're saying the prime minister. To a certain extent, nature, uh, humans are, are selfish by nature, and they go, what are you going to do for me? Right. 
What's in it for me? Why would I vote for you? What's in it for me? Yeah, and they do, and you're right. And that's that is and, and I have to say, when they do that, that's probably the most exciting part for me. Because most people you talk to don't have a lot of time. We're busy, we have busy lives. Yep. So most people you talk to uh, don't want to talk a whole lot. They kind of want to say, okay, thanks. Thanks, Janice, for coming. Yeah, yeah, I'll support you. Sure, I'll take a sign. But when I get someone who asks me about the issues or who says, well, what, what do you stand for? I'm excited. I mean, it could be the social studies teacher in me who, who loves to see that level of engagement. And it is neat because we have seen an increase, especially following the provincial election. You know, people who are, who are curious about the NDP and, and, uh, and curious about, uh, about the issues. So. And it seems to me, from what the short time I've spent in the riding, that there is one issue that shadows all others, and that's the economy. And okay. that's not just in your riding, but in northern Alberta. Right. What do you say to people about the economy and the NDP's plan to deal with it? Yeah, and you're right. I mean, it, and it does come up a lot, whether it's uh, the economy in the sense of uh, uh, poverty being an issue in a number of our communities, or also about just having ensuring that we have a strengthened economy as we, you know, deal with uncertain economic times. And uh, and the fact is, and this is why it's it's exciting to be able to talk about about our plans is, you know, the NDP has shown that we can balance, uh, you know, a, a, a strong economy with. A healthy environment. It's it's interesting because I do hear from people who've talked about who've talked to the conservatives and and they're 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 spreading this narrative that uh, that the NDP is going to kill the economy and that we're going to shut down the oil sands. And I know that because I've I've also experienced that from from my opponent. And and it's simply not true. So when a, a, a Toronto candidate for the NDP says, you know, let's leave that oil in the ground, right. they're not helping you very much, are they? Uh, no, and I mean, she clarified her statements, and uh, I, I think that's, again, that's the power in, in connecting with people and being able to talk about the fact that uh, the NDP does have a strong plan for the economy, and the M NDP hasn't had uh, a chance to govern federally, so we haven't seen, um, you know, there's no federal economic record that we can compare to, um, but we know provincially that we've run the most balanced budgets, and uh, and I think people f people forget that. And, and of course, I mean, we've got this Alberta... Uh, perspective right now where we have an NDP government that inherited 44 years of a PC mess and uh, we're dealing with cleaning that up right now um, but people get that people get the realities that it wasn't uh, it wasn't the NDP that's uh, causing for example global oil prices to go down or whatever it may be right but it may be if you're successful it may be your responsibility to figure out what the national energy policy is going to be and what are you going to do about the Alberta oil sands and what are you going to do about building a pipeline to move that product to market? Yeah. Those are questions I bet you get all the time. Yeah, we do. And then that's, again, that's the power in having those conversations because there are some, some myths out there and, uh, and we dispel those myths, right? So that, that myth that we're going to shut down the oil sands, that myth that that's we're going myth. to... That's right, that myth that we're going to... Uh, uh, that we're, that we're anti-pipelines. I mean, we've had Stephen that's Harper... That's a myth. We've had Stephen Harper in power for how long? How many pipelines has he gotten? On the front lawn of this modest house, we found a father and son engaged in a spirited battle for Nerf supremacy, which we interrupted just long enough to hear Dad's thoughts on why he will be making sure his vote is counted in the federal election of 2015. To uh, make sure that this kid has a job, that's a reasonable job for a re reasonable living. In other words, the future. Come October 19th, the people of Edmonton Griesbaugh will choose one person and charge them with the responsibility of helping to shape the future of our entire country.